Polish army, with a peace strength of about 300,000 men, was brought up to three and a half millions when mobilized. Consisted of approximately 28 infantry divisions, two divisions of mountaineers, one cavalry division, and one independent cavalry brigade. 11 tank battalions comprised some 700 tanks. The Air Force counted a thousand first line planes. To this must be added 44 artillery regiments equipped with guns ranging from the lightest to the heaviest caliber. Fantastic Polish war aims were proclaimed. The frantic Warsaw rulers speak of the impending destruction of the German armies at the gates of Berlin and picture the Polish border alongside the river Oder or even as far as the Elbe. The Polish provocations are growing more unbearable from day to day and terror increases against the defenseless German population which the Versailles Treaty had forced under the Polish yoke. Thousands of them flee before the persecutions of Polish gangs and seek refuge on right German territory. Their homes are systematically burned down and devastated by the Poles. Yet, the German Chancellor again offers a peaceful settlement of the conflict. When, however, even this last proposal was rejected by Poland, the Führer declares on September the 1st of 1939 that from now on, force would be answered by force. Under the threat of a Polish assault, the city of Danzig proclaims its return to the Reich on the same day, September 1st, 1939. Armed Polish irregulars are still entrenched in the post office, thus threatening the peace of the city from there. Men of the Danzig militia are clearing this dangerous hiding place under cover of a tank. The activities of the League Commissioner for Danzig have come to an end. Professor Burkhardt leaves his office and the swastika is for the first time flying in all the public buildings of the city. Danzig has definitely returned to the right. German troops enter the liberated city. Poland, however, is threateningly taking up arms against the just cause of the German nation. She marches up several armies which are to occupy Danzig, cut off East Prussia, and penetrate into the frontier districts of Silesia. The strategic aim of the German High Command is to encircle, simultaneously attack and destroy the large Polish army concentrated within the wide curve which the river Vistula forms in the centre of Poland. This is to be achieved by two army groups moving from the north and south. On September the 1st, 1939, the various units of the German troops are starting their counter-charge across the German-Polish border. 
The different formations are beginning to move, led by motorized troops and cavalry. Cavalry detachments and motorized machine gunners get in touch with the enemy and charge. The retreating enemy is given no breathing space. Our troops are closely holding on to its rear guard. Athe Gazette presents the first pictures of Finland's greatest victory, the utter destruction of the Russian 44th Division.
The Finns come out from their shelters for the attack. They're using Russian anti-aircraft guns captured from the enemy and now turned against the Russian planes. The Finns spread out among the forests. The Russians are jammed in mile-long columns along the roads, unable to move forwards or backwards. And then the massacre begins. By comparison, the Finns' losses in dead and wounded are minute. One wounded Finn is brought to a field dressing station. And now you can see why the Russians found they were fighting an almost invisible army. One Finn had a bullet through his chest, but the report said he was only slightly hurt. That's the sort of tough soldiers the Finns are. In fact, sometimes it's positively pleasant to be wounded. You know the rest of the story, how the battlefield became one vast heap of Russian machinery and men. Finns return to their bases with the spoils of war. Perhaps now the aggressors will think twice before they continue their policy of the mailed fist over the little nations. Finland has shown them that there are some small nations who would rather die fighting than give in. In spite of her bombed cities, in spite of her dead mothers and dead children, Finland's success has abolished the war of nerves. Whatever else the aggressors want, they'll have to fight for. Let the little states take heart. The days of the gangster are numbered. The red star of imperialist Russia is laid low in the white snows of Finland's idealism. Norway and Denmark had staked their survival upon the strictest interpretation of neutrality to escape the war. Their sympathies were with the Allies, but they took extraordinary precautions to avoid offending Hitler. So on April 9th, Hitler invaded Denmark and Norway. Denmark was powerless to resist and didn't. Norway was stunned by an avalanche of force and treachery. Fifth columnists, led by Major Quisling, a Norwegian traitor, spread panic and confusion. On May 9th, Hitler invaded Holland and Belgium. This pictorial record you are watching was made by Nazi cameramen at the order of Dr. Goebbels, the German propaganda minister. He showed this Wagnerian symphony of devastation to neutral nations in Europe and South America to frighten them into surrender. You will observe that here in Holland, for example, not one German soldier is killed or wounded or even suffers a fractured ankle in an avalanche of destruction. Using tanks, dive bombers, big guns, The Nazi machine broke the back of Dutch resistance in four days. This was Rotterdam, bombed after the Dutch forces had surrendered. The Nazis said there had been a mistake. The news had not reached the Luftwaffe in time. And the next morning, reconnaissance planes flew over the city as they had flown over Warsaw, recording for the propaganda ministry another tribute to the efficacy of the Luftwaffe, while Rotterdam buried its dead, as Warsaw had, and formal negotiations for surrender were duly completed. <laughs>